I don't see any more messages uh, for anyone else who wants to speak. Um, if anyone has anything more to say, please, uh, please send a message either to me or to everyone. Ah, sorry, I wasn't looking for raised hands. Okay, Colin, you're unmuted. Okay, uh, a very brief recollection. Um, I sent Conway my, um, my undergraduate thesis when I was thinking of applying to Cambridge, and it was only when I arrived at Cambridge much later that I discovered that, in fact, he never opened his post. So uh, he never got my thesis. Uh, but when I arrived at Cambridge, I, um, I did ask, uh, you know, where's Conway? And somebody pointed at the other end of the room saying, he's down there with the beard, the sandals, and the acolytes. Uh, so I decided I wouldn't uh, become one of the acolytes in that sort of way. But uh, I did end up meeting Conway when I was wheeling my unicycle down the street. And, uh, and he came running after me. Uh, quite a few people uh, ended up being quite envious of this idea that Conway would actually run after me. And I don't remember what it was that he asked me. I was so shocked. But that was my first meeting with Conway, and we ended up playing backgammon a lot in the department. He didn't play backgammon much with other people, but I played um, a very weird style. I would play an extreme back game, an extreme front game, an extreme running game, constantly switching between. And he found that intriguing to try and find a way of, uh, of, of countering the extreme forms that I would I'd, uh, flail between, because he wasn't so much interested in winning he was interested in a, a game that was fun. And that was, of course, uh, the main thing about John was that he was always interested in something that was fun and finding what went on inside that. So that was my experience of John. I met him many times afterwards, and ended up uh, in many conversations, uh, which enriched my life enormously. And I'm just so sad that it's not gonna happen again. Thanks very much. Thank you, Colin. Um, Glenn Smith has a quick memory to share, he says. All right. I had a chance, thanks to Siobhan, to spend some time with Conway in several different locations. The first time I was at Coxeter's house, and I understood how much Coxeter appreciated Conway and vice versa. Then later at the Coxeter Legacy um, in Princeton, I had a chance to spend some time with John at his house, and he was so very gracious. I shared an idea that I had on a uh, how how you move a cube octahedron into a aromic triconohedron, and so we went through the model, and out of that came this uh, octa bug, as we called it, uh, with the coordinates of the various structures you, one could make. And at the end of this meeting, he said the nicest thing to me because uh, he had been quite excited about the movements that we were doing with the, uh, with the you know, flexible cube octahedron. And I don't have the model here with me because we were just talking through it. But he said, I consider a good day when I learn something new. And when he shook my hand and he said, I want to thank you for a good day. So I'll always remember that. I got a chance to get some one-on-one -on -one time with him, and he was very, very gracious. Of course, his ability to think through problems was second to none. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, I have a message that uh, David has a few anecdotes to share. I'm not sure, David, who, but I will unmute you, and we will find out. Are you ready, David? I am unmuted, it says. Can you hear me? Oh, David Singmaster, welcome. Right, right. Uh, I guess most of you know I'm settled in England since 1970. And at that time I met Conway and I used to go up to Cambridge to the common room and be amazed by the junk that had piled up in his um, office. But um, I have um, I got involved with the London Mathematical Society and at dinner after one of the meetings Conway had been the speaker and he held forth about the calendar which was really quite fascinating because he, we know think of calendars as a mathematical problem but he had studied the problem of the change from the 
Julian to the Gregorian calendar, and he had actually gone and looked up the Act of Parliament, which um, in 1752, and it turned out to be immensely complicated. It didn't, didn't just involve skipping 11 days, but the problem is all the saints whose holidays fell during the period of involved had to be reallocated. Some of them were omitted, some of them were moved ahead 11 days, some were completely moved. Um, so I s spent a long evening listening to John's uh, exposition of all the problems. But uh, in um, the middle, middle 70s, I was at the Conf British Combinatorial Conference in Cambridge, and I got assigned to chair a session which Conway was in. And he arrived a little bit late, and he said, I think I've got an hour. And I didn't have the nerve to say he only had half an hour. And at the end of half an hour, he was in full flow. And I don't know if any of you have ever had the, well, the duty to try to cut off John Conway in the middle of a lecture. And nobody else in the room wanted to stop either. So we let it go on for an hour. Uh, quite. And another incident, he was giving a talk to the Royal, in, Royal Institution, and I was asked to do a display of puzzles for the talk. And I came in with a couple of boxes of puzzles and put them out of display and so on. And John came over to me and said, um, David, would you mind taking my girlfriend out to dinner? I thought this was a bit strange, but it turned out he hadn't checked. And the dinner that he was being given in the Royal Institution was around Michael Faraday's table. And this had a fixed number of seats. And he hadn't bothered to ask if he could bring his girlfriend along. So I had to take his girlfriend out to dinner, which was a rather pleasant, uh, unexpected pleasure. Anyway, that's just some of my personal contacts with John. Thank, Thank you, David. David. Um, let's go now to Rosie. Um, I believe this is uh, Rosie Conway, if I'm, if I'm correct. Yes, that's right. I'd just like to thank you all for this wonderful, wonderful tribute. I've been glued to it for the last, well, I guess three and a half hours, but I'm going to have to go now <laughs> because it's getting on for 3 a.m. here in, in, in England. And I, uh, yeah, real life's going to hit me, I guess, in the morning, though it's a rather unreal life now. Um, for coronavirus and for losing my wonderful father. And um, it's so gratifying to know and to have seen just a few and heard from a few of the people who hold him in such high esteem. Thank you very much for this. And I'd like to look at it again at leisure. So I, I hope I'll be able to do that. Thank you all very much. Good night. Thank you so much, Rosie. And yes, we do. We are recording it and we plan to share the recording. It will take some processing time, but uh, we'll make it available. And thank you. Thank you so much for joining. Good night. And oh, I'm told that um, Diana wants to speak. I had not seen that. So um, Diana, um, I'll put you on right now. Hi, everyone. You know, I was afraid this was going to be too sad, but I've really, really enjoyed it. And I've listened to everything everyone said, and it hasn't made me sad. It's made me really, really happy. And um, just like Rosie said, it's, it's really, really gratifying to see how much John touched so many people. And I'm sorry our son's gone to bed, but he was on for a little while too. Um, 
you know, John's in the room, by the way, just so you know, he's on the shelf. So thank you everyone so very much. Thank you so much, Diana. We, we really uh, appreciate you all joining, appreciate you joining us all and we're, we're touched. Paul, are you ready to say a few more words? Yeah, although I don't, I don't know what to say after that what Diana said. <laughs> yeah. I think what John Conway taught me personally was that everybody gets to have their own math. You can go as far out as you want, it, and, and, it's, and it's just fun, you know? And it's all, these, all the mathematicians that are speaking tonight, and the artists, and I, I, you know, I hate to differentiate, but they're all talking about having fun, you know? And that was certainly my experience of Conway. And I think, you know, I, I hate to paraphrase Max Planck, but I, I would say this about mathematics. It advances funeral by funeral, but I'd say it in the best light with, with John, because when he died, he sort of opened up math to everybody. I mean, the 20, 21st century math is math anybody can play with and have fun in. And I think that's a wonderful thing. It's a great legacy. So I guess that's what I have to say. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Rebecca Mercury, um, are you ready? Yes, I am. Great. Yes, hi, thanks for recognizing me. This has been an amazing evening. Um, we're coming up on, this is our 40th year of the Princeton Association of Computing Machinery, IEEE Computer Society. And I've been on the board uh, for most of that time. So we at some point came across the, um, uh, you know, John Conway, who gave a keynote address for one of the IEEE banquets, and that's where I first met him. It has to have been in the 90s. And, um, and then we just, you know, all of us, you know, those of us who knew him, Roger Toby, who I know is on um, watching tonight too, um, we got to know him. He was just so generous with his time, and that's what the thread I'm hearing from all of this. Um, Roger and I, Roger, more, much more than me, but I would occasionally go also with Roger um, to that hallway, this famous hallway in Fine Hall, and if he was there, you could talk to him and, you know, engage in conversation, and we would also um, many times ply him with food. Um, I heard Tomo Sushi mention many times you know, this was one of, you know, his favorite places. And if you bought him a meal, he'd be very happy to uh, give a talk for our organization. And so we had the, um, the Gardner Celebration of Mind, which was an outgrowth of the G4G events. And we were holding those annually. And, uh, and Conway would come and, you know, give like a 15 or 20 minute talk, just a pre-talk to our computer graphics show. And, you know, bring members of the family and that sort of thing. And it was just a really wonderful opportunity for him to be there. He shared with us so much. So many hundreds and hundreds of people got to hear him just in these short lectures and occasionally longer ones at the banquets and things. Um, but there was one memory in particular that I wanted to mention, and this is sort of fitting for the end of all of um, these great, wonderful recollections. Um, there was one of these times where, you know, we were eating together outside. It was a very hot day. I remember it was, um, we were outdoors near uh, one of the, the ice cream parlors. He loved the ice cream parlors as well. And just sitting there and he was musing about all of the many things he had worked on. By then he had won so many awards and all of his great publications. And, and he started saying to me that, that he came to the realization that everything he had worked on was really just a variation of the same thing. And he seemed very distressed by this. And I said, you, do you really believe that? They're just so diverse in all of these ideas. And he was very despondent, actually, and really felt that it was all the same thing. It was all working out the same problem. Um, and he felt that he was, <laughs> I mean, how, how he could say this, but he felt that he was not tremendously creative because he was always working on the same problem. But, you know, of course, uh, what all of this discussion attests is, you know, the amazing insights that he had. And I, I guess I'm leaving this as an open question. 
um, did he ever write down the connectivity? You know, at first I thought he was just pulling my leg, but but he really insisted that he really believed this. And I maybe someone will find this in his papers, or maybe someone will be able to demonstrate the connectivity of all the things that he worked on. But I do wonder about that, and I also do understand why it might have made him sad, but he shouldn't. Be. So thank you very much, John, and thank you very much, all of you, for for having this great evening and, and remembering him. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, Lucas Garone, are you ready? Yeah, so I had the privilege to meet Conway a few times because he still traveled lots of places. And, and one of those was a Canada USA math camp where he would still go every year to just talk with students. And he was always generous with his time. And I knew this was the math camp to go to because of course Conway went there. And um, I learned a few things I would never be able to hear anywhere else. And uh, many people know me for Rubik's Cube stuff. And he told me about a bit of the very early history. And he told me, you know, when I lost interest in, in those kinds of puzzles it was when the four by four by four came out because there would be variation after variation after variation and there would never be any end of it. So he stopped doing that and he left all that big area of math open for us. And there's still a bunch of nice low hanging unanswered fruit so um, I guess I'm thankful that he, he did enough to get that started and stepped out of the way for us to still do some of it. Thank you, Lucas. Um, Danny Slater wanted to speak next, I believe. Are you ready? Yeah. Hi. Um, so, I mean, <clears throat> uh, I'm a professor at, at Carnegie Mellon. I spent a semester at Princeton uh, in the early 90s, I think maybe 1991 when they were doing the um, Geometry and the Imagination course with Bill Thurston and, and, um, and Conway and they were doing, and, and Peter Doyle, they were doing this amazing course. And I got to know all of them and I ended up writing a paper with Bill Thurston. But um, I was, uh, you know, I spent some time with Conway as well. And uh, one time my dad was visiting and um, I, I introduced him to John Conway, he went to the this, this, his lab in, in Fine Hall, which was all, all, you know, all the models and all that stuff and all the students were hanging out in there. And he made this thing for my dad. And unfortunately, I lost it. I don't have it anymore. But during this meeting, I, I decided to make it myself. And I made one. I have it right here. I'll show you in a second. It's an optical illusion that um, Conway made and, and he gave it to my dad. So here, here, here it is. I don't know if it's going to work for you guys. So here we have just a cube, right? But when I twist it, it's going all the wrong way. I don't know if you, I don't know if it's how you're perceiving it, but it looks like, it looks like a con, it looks like the front corner is sticking out toward you, but actually that's not what it is. It's, it's the other way. <laughs> so, so anyway, this is something that, uh, that John, John Conway uh, showed me and my dad. It was really, really cool. And he gave, he gave the, uh, the model uh, to, 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 to my dad. So, uh, that's my story about John Conway. Thank you, Danny. Very fun. Uh, Neil Calkin, are you ready? I am. Uh, I just wanted to say that John was the most amazing speaker that I have ever seen. He could take any concept and explain it to any audience, be it a PhD mathematician or a five-year-old child. And I would come out of listening to him speak with an almost visceral understanding of whatever topic he had been speaking about. And it was fantastic. And it would last for about 30 minutes. It was like Chinese food. I would be hungry again 30 minutes later and I could not reconstruct my understanding that he had left with me. And that is the thing I miss most about John. Thank you for running this, Bob. And everybody. Thank you, Neil. Well, this has been, um Incredible. Um, I think uh, we've, we've been blessed to have uh, an amazing set of speakers and this amazing opportunity. It's been, uh, we're four hours in now <laughs> to sharing our memories. And, um, you know, I think Don alone could still be talking <laughs> if, if, if I hadn't stopped him. Um, we could go uh, on forever. If I could interrupt. Um, yes. I, yeah. Um, I'm going to stop the recording, but I think that I'll uh, change the, the rules so that it will allow people to unmute themselves. So that would allow people to just speak up if they have more to say. 
but we're going to uh, leave that part out of the recording. So thanks everybody for coming. It's been, you know, a, an amazing four hours. Thank you, Frank. And let, yeah, thank you to Frank Ferris, who is actually hosting this Zoom session, and to Scott Gortman for co-moderating, and to, to Stacy with uh, the, the BAM organization. Thank you.